Thank you very much, uh, Susan. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Tyler Vanderweel, for being with us today. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure, it's an honor to uh, introduce to all of you Dr. Tyler Vanderweel from Harvard University, where he's a professor of epidemiology and uh, he holds joint appointments in both the Department of Biology and Biostatistics and, this, uh, and the, uh, sorry, the Department of, uh, this department is part of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Um, he's also the director of the Human Flourishing Program and the co-director of the Initiative on Health, Religion, Sexuality at Harvard University. Uh, he is somebody who clearly enjoyed being in university a lot. Uh, and he has uh, an undergraduate in philosophy and theology, which he did simultaneously with a degree in mathematics from the University of Oxford. Uh, he also has a master's degree in finance and applied economics, followed by two master's degrees. I'm very curious to know how you did it. One in Harvard and one in Oxford in biostatistics and in mathematics, uh, respectively. And uh, finally, it seems that it was biostatistics that attracted him most. He finished off with a PhD in biostatistics also. And uh, this has been his area of research interest, one of his areas of research interest, I should say. Um, he is very well known for his work in uh, causal. Uh, he's focused on both theory and methods for distinction, distinguishing between association and causation in the biomedical and social sciences, and more recent psychosocial measurement theory. Uh, he has several publications that are widely cited. Uh, in the statistics and epidemiology, epidemiology literature, which is uh, something unusual for um, you know a person who is working in on many interdisciplinary projects as well. And the uh, article that he's going to talk to us about today, the work that he's going to talk to us about today, is some is his, in fact his most highly cited paper, having uh, appeared in the Annals of Internal Medicine a few years ago in 2017. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Mandeville, uh, you may begin your presentation. Wonderful, thank you uh, very much for the kind introduction and thank you all for coming today. Um, I will be speaking on sensitivity analysis and observational research and introducing this new metric, uh, the E-value, which uh, has, has become rather popular. And the motivation for this work was that I, I have taught this topic of sensitivity analysis for unmeasured confounding to students first at University of Chicago and then Harvard for a number of years. And I, I lecture on the material and give you know, the students uh, homework assignments to implement these techniques, um, because I think it really is critical in assessing evidence for causation. Um, but then I would find some years later that no one would really use these techniques in practice. And when I would ask why, um, the response would often be, well, you know, it's difficult to implement and it takes a lot of time and difficult to present in big tables and reviewers and editors don't understand it. It just makes it more difficult to get published. So I've, I've, I've uh, abandoned it entirely. And so I tried to take these um, objections uh, seriously. And that's really what motivated this, uh, this E-value measure, which I will get to later on in the presentation. Um, but what, uh, what I plan to do is first give a broad introduction to this notion of sensitivity analysis. I'll review the cornfield conditions, one of the earliest forms of sensitivity analysis. I'll talk about a, a fairly general approach to sensitivity analysis using bounding factors. And then we'll move on to introduce this E-value measure. I'll walk through a handful of empirical examples, um, and, then, and then I'll um, make some remarks on the use of different effect measure scales. Most of the discussion will be focused on the risk ratio scale, but I'll talk about how this extends to other measures as well, and then offer some um, concluding remarks at the end. Um, so, of course, you know, unmeasured confounding is an important problem in, in much observational research in the biomedical and social sciences. And when we have some exposure A and we're interested in its effect on some outcome Y, we, we try to do the best we can to collect what we think might be a common causes or confounders of that exposure outcome uh, relationship and try to control for them in the analysis. 
Um, but with observational data, we're never sure whether there might be some unmeasured factor U related both to our exposure and our outcome of interest that might bias the relationships. And so what sensitivity analysis or what's sometimes more frequently called bias analysis and epidemiology um, does is it helps us assess um, how strong would the effects of U on the exposure and the outcome have to be for the observed association to be attributable solely to unmeasured confounding? Um, these techniques can also be useful um, to try to establish a, a plausible range of effects had we had data on U, if, if we know something about the magnitude of the effects of U on the exposure um, and on the outcome. And I'll, I'll talk about how um, these techniques can be used in these different ways. Um, an example I'll be returning to later in, in the talk is a number of studies have found that uh, maternal breastfeeding is associated with both better uh, maternal and infant health outcomes. Um, but most of these analyses use observational data and the concern in many of these is um, inadequate control for socioeconomic status. And in the West, at least, there's a pretty steep gradient between socioeconomic status and, and breastfeeding. And so the concern is that maybe this association is being observed simply because uh, those in better circumstances end up breastfeeding more and having better uh, health outcomes. So to what extent might these associations be sensitive or robust to such potential unmeasured confounding. Um, the term sensitivity analysis is used um, outside of the context of unmeasured confounding as well to address other uh, types of, of biases like selection bias and measurement error or, or even uh, model misspecification. Um, and, and sometimes the whole range of these techniques, at least in epidemiology, is referred to as bias analysis. And statistics and the social sciences, the term sensitivity analysis is somewhat more more common, but bias analysis is used somewhat more frequently in, in epidemiology. Um, and an important and early approach to doing so, an application of these ideas appears in, in Cornfield and, and colleagues' work in 1959 concerning the smoking lung cancer association. Um, and, and at the time, there was still debate over whether this really was causal, whether the famously uh, Sir Ronald Fisher had proposed that maybe a a uh, genetic variant was a, a responsible for both increasing smoking and increasing lung cancer. And maybe this was uh, perhaps uh, the, the um, entire story with regard to why we were observing this association. And what Cornfield and colleagues did is they said, well, okay, let's suppose there were such an unmeasured confounder. How strongly would it have to be associated with the exposure and the outcome, smoking and lung cancer, to explain away this uh, association we've observed? And what they showed is for such a variant to be um, solely responsible, it would have to increase the likelihood of lung cancer by tenfold and be tenfold more common among smokers than non-smokers to explain away this association. And this was just thought to be um, you know, too strong to, to, to really be plausible. And so the sensitivity analysis approach really helped provide more definitive evidence that that smoking lung cancer relationship was indeed causal. Um, so what were those conditions that, that Cornfield and colleagues used? Well, they were essentially as follows. If we, if we let RR denote the um, estimated risk ratio relating the exposure to the outcome, possibly conditional on some measured covariate C. Um, and if you were a binary unmeasured confounding variable, um, then what Cornfield and, and colleagues showed is that um, for the relationship between the unmeasured confounder U and the exposure and the unmeasured confounder and the outcome to be solely responsible for that risk ratio, it would have to, those confounding associations would have to satisfy certain properties. Um, if we let UA denote the risk ratio relating the exposure and the unmeasured confounder and UY denote the risk ratio relating U and the outcome, um, then the cornfield conditions that they showed are that you could not be entirely responsible for the observed risk ratio between the exposure and the outcome unless both UA and UY were larger than the observed risk ratio. If one of them were smaller, then you couldn't be entirely uh, responsible. And so this was, this was very helpful in that smoking uh, lung cancer debate. Once again, uh, Fisher had, had proposed that maybe a genetic variant was responsible for this association, had published this letter in, in Nature in 19... Uh, 58 uh, proposing this as an explanation. And here's a picture of uh, Fisher happily smoking away on his pipe. Um, uh, but you know, at that time, there were a number of case control and cohort studies suggesting pretty sub 
substantial association. So here's a study by Hammond and Horn, Horn study published in 1958, uh, with an estimated risk ratio of 10.7, confidence interval 8 to 14.3. And so what the cornfield conditions implies that for um, such an unmeasured confounder, genetic variant to be entirely responsible for the association, that variant would have to be associated with a 10.7 fold increase in lung cancer and would have to be 10.7 fold more common among smokers than non-smokers. And so, so again, this just didn't seem plausible. Almost certainly some of the association was due to a causal effect. And I do think these cornfield conditions can still be uh, quite useful rules of thumb today to, to determine whether we can completely rule out uh, confounding as a potential explanation. But what they're less useful for is trying to determine kind of a plausible corrected um, effect size. Maybe we don't think all of it's due to confounding, but perhaps some of it is. And if we were to take that into account, how do we, how do we do go about doing um, a potential correction for unmeasured uh, variables? And so sensitivity analysis techniques, I think, can help address that question as well. Um, so a little bit more formally, and this is kind of the mathematics of what we'll be, be doing here. Um, if we think about our observed data and, and, and the risk ratio scale, what we're going to be doing is looking at the risk ratio, comparing the exposed and unexposed subjects, a uh, conditional on our measured covariate C. And that'll be our, our observed uh, risk ratio. What we would like to do, but can't do, is adjust for that, standardize that by uh, the distribution of U as, as well. Um, but of course, we can't do that because we don't have data on U. And so what we're going to be doing is essentially comparing our observed risk ratio conditional on C to what we would have obtained had we been able to adjust for U uh, as well. If we want, we can kind of frame this within the potential outcomes or counterfactual framework. We don't, we don't have to do so, but for those who like that framework, um, that, that, that can be useful. And, and that then works as follows. If we let uh, Y subscript A be the potential outcome or counterfactual outcome, for each individual, if possibly contrary to fact, we could set the exposure A to the value little a. Um, then if it were the case that the measured covariate C sufficed to control for confounding for the effect of the exposure on the outcome in, in counterfactual notation, that is if um, the counterfactuals Y A are independent of the observed exposure A conditional on C. In other words, if within strata of C, those who actually had the exposure and those who actually didn't uh, are comparable on what would have happened under, under different counterfactual scenarios. So if C itself suffice to control for confounding, then that first expression here uh, would give us the causal risk ratio, what we would obtain if we had given everyone the exposure versus no one the exposure. But of course, we're worried that the measured covariates don't suffice to control for confounding and that um, one or more unmeasured covariates you might, might be needed. Um, so if it were the case that U and C together suffice to control for confounding, but, but C alone didn't, um, then that second expression would give us the causal risk ratio, but the first expression would be biased for the causal risk ratio. And so we're going to define the bias factor on the risk ratio scale um, to be the ratio of what we obtained just adjusting for C versus what we would have obtained had we been able to adjust for U as well, sort of the, our estimate versus the truth. That's our, our bias factor on the risk ratio scale. And we're going to express that bias factor in terms of different sensitivity analysis parameters relating the unmeasured confounder to the exposure and the unmeasured confounder to the outcome. We don't necessarily know what those parameters are, but we can try to vary them in a sensitivity analysis to see how much our estimate might shift because of unmeasured confounding. And there are lots of different techniques uh, out there to do this. There's a whole literature. One could spend a whole course going through all, all the different uh, uh, techniques, um, uh, lots of techniques on the ratio scale, lots of techniques on the difference uh, scale. And I, th I think many of these techniques are, are, are useful and, and helpful and, and good, and I, I teach them uh, and abuse them routinely. Um, many of these techniques make assumptions, um, you know, often to get more simple, easy to use algebraic expressions. But among the assumptions that are sometimes employed, are that the unmeasured confounder is binary, and many of the techniques make, make that assumption. Another common assumption is that there's no interaction between the unmeasured confounder and the exposure. Um, and, and so in other words, the, the effect of the unmeasured confounder 
on the outcome, if that were to increase the outcome by threefold, then it's the same effect of, of threefold increase for both the exposed and the unexposed subjects. And, and that assumption um, often leads to much simpler algebraic expression. So it can be, can be very useful in obtaining uh, easier to employ results. Um, you know, another common assumption is that there's only one uh, unmeasured confounder. And in fact, the corner field conditions make all three of assumptions that there's only one measured confounder, that it's binary, and that there's no interaction with the with the exposure. These techniques are sometimes criticized um, on the grounds that they're, they're, they are in some sense making assumptions to assess assumptions. So we're making assumptions like these to assess our assumptions about unmeasured confounding. And so it's sometimes then objected, oh, well, then do we need another sensitivity analysis to assess the assumptions we're making within the sensitivity analysis itself? And are we going to endanger of ending up in an infinite regress? I'm only partially um, sympathetic to, 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 to this objection to, to these techniques. Um, I think often these assumptions are just made principally to get a simple, easy to use expression and that the techniques are still useful to get some handle on whether our results are sensitive or, or robust. Um, but as we'll see in the material that follows, in fact, we can relax all of these assumptions um, and still make uh, meaningful progress. Um, there are other techniques that don't impose these assumptions, but either require specifying a large number of parameters, which can be make it make it difficult to use in practice, or alternatively, um, specify parameters that make no reference to the entered confounder itself, kind of specifying the bias directly, and those can be, I think, more difficult to interpret in practice. So I'm, I'm going to go through a technique which really relaxes all these assumptions um, and uh, um, and, and still has parameters, which I think are fairly easy to interpret and will give us bounds on our causal effect. Um, so we're going to assume that we have one or more unmeasured confounders U, um, and we're going to define two parameters. And these are sort of going to look just like generalizations of the, the cornfield condition parameters. Uh, the first parameter is a little easier to interpret. We'll call this RRUY. Um, and it'll basically just be the maximum effect of U on Y on the risk ratio scale. Um, how we're actually going to define it is as follows. Uh, first, we look um, amongst the unexposed group and we look at what's the most any change in different levels of U could increase the likelihood of the outcome on the risk ratio scale. So what's the largest effect you could have? So if you had six levels, we'd ask, what's the effect of U on the outcome comparing U equals one to U equals six? Or what about U equals one to U equals five? Or what about U equals three versus U equals four? We'd look at all those different risk ratios and we choose the largest of them. So what's the largest effect any change in U can have on the risk ratio scale amongst the unexposed uh, conditional on the covariate C? Um, so it's the largest effect you can have on the outcome amongst the unexposed. Then we do the same thing for the exposed. What's the largest effect you could have on the outcome on the risk ratio scale for the exposed subjects? And we take the larger of those two risk ratios. So we're no longer imposing a no interaction assumption. We're just taking um, wherever the effect of you on the outcome is larger, either the exposed or the unexposed. And that will be our first parameter. So again, essentially the maximum effect of you on the outcome on the risk ratio scale. The second parameter is a little bit more tricky to interpret. It's Looking across the different levels of U, if we look at how much more likely U is to take that level amongst the exposed and the unexposed, what is that risk ratio? And what's the maximum of those risk ratios across the different levels of U? So we could look at level U equals one. How much more likely is U to take that level amongst the exposed versus the unexposed? Um, what about U equals two? How much more likely is U to take that level amongst the exposed versus the unexposed? What about three, four, five, six? And then we take the maximum of those uh, risk ratios. So if you were binary, this essentially just collapses to a, a normal risk ratio. But if you has multiple categories, it's, it's sort of a generalization of the risk ratio. Um, importantly, and we'll come back to this issue, but importantly, both of these parameters are defined conditional on the measured covariate C. So both of these are kind of picking up the residual confounding due to you having already adjusted for the measured covariate C. And this is going to be important in, in the interpretation of these parameters, because if, for example, we haven't measured income and we're worried that income could be a confounder, but we have measured and adjusted for um, education and occupation and home ownership, 
uh, we might think, well, having adjusted for these other things, which are in fact closely related to income, the residual confounding due to income, you know, might still be present, but it might be quite a bit smaller. Um, and so these parameters are defined conditional on C having already adjusted for the measure covariate C. And again, we'll come back to that point. Um, so it can be a little tricky thinking about what are these parameters, what might they be, and we'll come back to that issue. Uh, but once we've specified them, uh, it's actually very straightforward to proceed from, from here. Um, if once we've specified the two parameters, one can show that the maximum bias that can be generated on the risk ratio scale is given by this formula here, just the product of those two parameters divided by the sum minus one. Uh, it's a bit difficult to prove this result, but it's very easy to implement it. Um, if, you know, if the parameters were three and two, if we thought that the unmeasured confounder could at most increase the outcome by threefold and was at most twofold more likely amongst the exposed than the unexposed, then uh, the, this bounding factor, B, would be three times two, that's six, divided by three plus two, that's five, minus one, that's four, six over four, 1.5. That's the most such an unmeasured confounder could shift the risk ratio by, by a ratio of 1.5. It cannot do so more with, with those parameters. Um, this is a bound. It doesn't mean that such an unmeasured confounder would necessarily create that much bias, but it, it, it could. We can construct a U that, that has those parameters that does. Um, but once we've correct, calculated that bounding factor, um, then it's, you know, it's straightforward to obtain a corrected estimate. We just take our observed estimate and both limits of the confidence interval, divide it by this bounding factor B, and that's the most such an unmeasured confounder could shift our um, observed estimates. So, um, you know, if, if that still indicates that we still have evidence for a, a notable effect, then, then we, we, we really do have some, um, some evidence. Um, everything that goes into this uh, bounding factor formula should be greater than one. Um, you know, we've defined these risk ratios as maxima, so everything that goes into the formula is greater than one. If, if we're thinking about a, you know, protective confounder, which decreases the um, likelihood of the outcome by twofold. Um, so the risk ratio is one half, then we would take inverses first um, and, uh, and, and put two in the formula. So everything that goes into the formula should be greater than one. The bounding factor will always be greater than one. Um, and then if we have a, um, you know, a causative risk ratio uh, greater than one, then, then we divide the estimate and and the confidence limits by that bounding factor to see the most it could be shifted to the null. Um, if we have an initially protective risk ratio, um, something less than one, uh, then we would multiply the estimate in both limits of the confidence interval by that bounding factor to see the most that our estimate could be shifted towards the null. Um, this bound is in most cases sharp insofar as one can't do better than it without further assumptions and one can always construct the U uh, to achieve it. That's the case almost always it, with really extreme parameter values under you know, certain prevalences of the exposure and the outcome. One can sometimes do a little bit better and Arvind Soljander has a nice paper where he recently characterized the um, uh, when, when this is and is not sharp, but most of the time it is, it is sharp. Um, so let's just see how this, you know, works in practice. Um, this will we'll do the smoking lung cancer example, but we will later move on to less extreme uh, examples as, as well. Um, but, but again, we had that estimate of a risk ratio of 10.7 um, from the Hammond and Horn uh, cohort study, confidence interval 8 to 14.3. If we specified the two parameters as 2 and 3, uh, the, the variant increased the likelihood of lung cancer by twofold and was three, four more common amongst smokers than non-smokers. Um, then we would just plug in those numbers, two times three divided by two plus three minus one into the bounding factor formula. Um, we get a bounding factor of 1.5. We would divide the estimate in both limits of the confidence interval by 1.5. Uh, and we'd get a corrected estimate of 7.1 confidence interval, 5.3 to 9.5. Uh, again, corrected in the sense that this is the most that such an unmeasured confounder could shift our estimate downwards. We'd still really have a pretty large effect here, even under fairly substantial confounding. It can be interesting to, to go back to the um, cornfield conditions and say, what, do, what happens if we plug those into the bounding factor formula? 
So if we do that, if we put 10.7 in for both of the parameters, uh, we can calculate the bounding factor 10.7 times 10.7 divided by 10.7 plus 10.7 minus 1. That would give us a bounding factor of 5.6. Divide the estimate, both limits of the confidence interval, by 5.6. We would still have a uh, just risk ratio of 1.9, confidence interval 1.3 to 2.5. So even under the parameter values suggested by the cornfield conditions, we actually would still have evidence for an effect. Not even confounding that strong can in fact explain away the estimate. So it's a little surprising initially insofar as we've relaxed all of cornfield at L's assumptions, and yet we're still getting what seems to be a stronger result. So what's going on here? Um, well, essentially what's going on here is that the cornfield conditions are considering the parameters one at a time, and this bounding factor is considering them jointly at the same time. So with the cornfield conditions, when considering one parameter, the effect of U on the outcome, for example, it's assuming the other one could be absolutely anything. It, it's effectively assuming it's infinite. Um, and if, if we don't do that, um, if we look at them both at the same time, we can essentially do better uh, than the corn field conditions. And that, that's what the bounding factor formula gives us. So if we take that bounding factor formula and send one of the parameters off to infinity, we actually recover the corn field conditions. Um, but again, if we're willing to consider them both simultaneously, we, we effectively can improve on corn field conditions while relaxing um, these other assumptions. So that kind of explains this paradox. I mean, it can be interesting to kind of look at across different values of the two parameters, how much bias can in fact be, be generated. So you know, here we're plotting the effect of U on the outcome and the effect, uh, the, the relationship between the exposure and the unmeasured confounder. And for example, if both of those had risk ratios of two, then that could at most explain a risk ratio estimate of 1.33. If both were three, that could at most explain a risk ratio estimate of 1.8. If one were two and the other were 1.5, that could at most explain a, a risk ratio estimate of 1.2. That's the most that um, our risk ratio could be could be shifted. So you know, in some of these scenarios, fairly substantial confoundings needed to explain away an estimate. But we might ask, now how are we coming up with these parameter values. It sort of seems like we're pulling them out of a hat, twofold, threefold. Where are we getting these numbers from? Um, and they can be difficult to specify. Um, and so it's sometimes objected to sensitivity analysis techniques in general that, that they're too subjective, that the you know, investigators make up these numbers and they might choose them just to make their effect estimate look good. And then what have we really gained? Um, so it's sometimes objective that these sensitivity analysis approaches are too subjective to be of much use. And, and I think this is an important objection and one that needs to be taken seriously. Um, but I think there are different ways to address it, different ways to more objectively ground uh, a sensitivity analysis. And here, here are four possible ways in the latter part of this talk, I'll be focusing on the first, but I think each of these four can be quite useful in different circumstances. Um, so one, and this is what's going to motivate the E-value, is one could report how large the effects of the unmeasured confounder would have to be to completely explain away our estimate or to completely shift the confidence interval so that it includes the null. Um, and, and then let the reader decide whether they think confounding of that magnitude is plausible or not. Um, so here the game's no longer we'll, we'll play around with the sensitivity analysis parameters to make our effect estimate look good, it's we play around with our effect uh, our, our sensitivity analysis parameters to get our effect to go away completely. And once again, leave it to the reader's judgment as to whether they think uh, confounding that extreme is plausible. Uh, a second approach is to create a big table of, of, of values of the two or, or, or more parameters um, and to report corrected estimates and confidence intervals for each possible combination. And then to look over the different scenarios and see how robust or sensitive one's estimates are. Um, and I think for this approach to be plausible, you need to include values of the sensitivity analysis parameters that are much more extreme than you think that you know, their actual values are so that the reader can get um, a sense. But if over you know, a wide range of parameters, the effect does look reasonably robust, one can be more sure about one's conclusions. But if just a little bit of unmeasured confounding suffices to explain the effect away, um, then one would want to be more cautious. Um, but I think this can also often be a very useful approach. 
Uh, a third helpful approach sometimes can be going through the measured confounders one by one, omitting them one by one from the analysis and seeing which of the measured confounders seems to make the biggest difference, which of the measured confounders changes the effect estimate the most. Um, then ask, what are the sensitivity analysis parameter values for that most important measured confounder? Then ask, if I had an unmeasured confounder with those same sensitivity analysis parameters, would that suffice to explain away my estimate or my confidence interval? If not, then one can say, well, for an unmeasured confounder to have to explain away my estimate, it would have to be more important than my most important measured confounder. And that can sometimes be a fairly convincing argument. How convincing really depends on the circumstances. If you're in a study where you've really controlled for everything under the sun, all known risk factors of the outcome, um, but it's observational data, you're still never entirely sure whether there might be unmeasured confounding. Um, it, it can be a fairly convincing argument. But if the initial set of measured confounders is very poor, if we are missing you know, the two or three most important measured confounders, then that argument might not be uh, persuasive at all. But at least in some circumstances, I think this third approach can also be quite helpful. Uh, and then a fourth possible approach is to use external data, uh, other studies that may have measured the covariate that you're missing. Um, to, to try to get a sense as to how large these effect estimates might be, um, or to use expert opinion to try to inform the sensitivity analysis parameters. Um, interestingly, only the fourth approach here really requires knowing what the unmeasured confounder is. Uh, the other three can be used even if you think you've controlled for absolutely everything, but you, you don't know. This is observational data, so maybe there's some unknown unmeasured confounder. Um, uh, but, but again, I think each of these approaches can be useful in different circumstances, uh, which to use, I think, again, depends on circumstances and, and possibly even on target journal. I, I, I think a lot of the epidemiologic journals are, are really quite happy to see a big table with lots of different sensitivity analysis parameters, a bunch of different corrected estimates, and I think that's a, a very good and helpful and more thorough sensitivity analysis. Sometimes clinical journals are more resistant uh, to, to, to that approach because it takes up a lot of space and more difficult to interpret. But I think even in those contexts, that, that first approach of, explain, of, of reporting how much, how strong the unmeasured confounding associations would have to be to explain away the effect can be quite useful. And that's really what's going to constitute this, this E-value measure that I'll be talking about now. Um, so the E-value is defined as the minimum strength of association on the risk ratio scale that an unmeasured confounder would need to have with both the exposure and the outcome conditional on the measured covariates to fully explain away the observed um, exposure outcome association. Um, more formally, um, it's looking at all possible values of the two uh, sensitivity analysis parameters that would suffice to explain away the observed risk ratio, and it's asking um, of all those different values, if we want to minimize the maximum of the two sensitivity analysis parameters, how low can we get it? That's, that's the E-value. So this is what we've tried to describe in words. This is the formal definition. It takes its name E-value because it's a measure pertaining to the evidence for causality or the evidence for robustness to potential confounding. And so what one can show is that if you have an observed risk ratio of magnitude RR, then if both of the sensitivity analysis parameters are greater than this quantity here, just the risk ratio plus the square root of the observed risk ratio times the observed risk ratio minus one, then that could suffice to, control, to, to explain away the observed association, but weaker confounding could not, where the strength of confounding is defined by that bounding factor formula. And so again, very easy to, to, to compute. Um, and so we could apply this both to the estimate and to the limit of the confidence interval closest to the null. Uh, this is the formula we would use if that observed risk ratio was, was causative in direction, if it were greater than one. If it were less than one, then we first take inverses and then apply uh, the E value formula. Um, so if we did that for uh, that smoking lung cancer association, if we plug 10.7 into the formula, we would get an E value for the estimate of 20.9. And if we did that for the limit of the confidence interval closest to the null, eight, if we put that into the formula, we'd get an E value for the confidence interval of 15.5. So we could start making statements like with an observed risk ratio of 10.7, an unmeasured confounder that was associated with both the outcome and the exposure by risk ratios of 20.9 fold each above and beyond the measured covariates could explain away the estimate, but weaker confounding could, could not. You know, alternatively and arguably you know, preferably, we could, um, we could report all of the values of the two confounding parameters 
Um, that suffice to explain away the association. We can do that for the estimate and for the limit of the confidence interval closest to the null. Um, so we could plot all those parameters here that might explain away the estimate. And um, you know, the way to get the larger of the two as small as possible is what the E value is, that point here, uh, 20.9. Um, so one of the parameters could be a bit smaller, maybe one of them is only 18, but then the other one would have to be considerably bigger, maybe it would have to be 26 to explain it away. But we can again plot all of those values and we could do that for the confidence interval as well. Okay, so let's move on to some slightly less extreme examples to get a sense as to how this might work in practice. Uh, we'll return to the breastfeeding. Uh, um, literature and, and again concerns that these associations with health are confounded by um, socioeconomic status. Uh, so one study reported risk ratio between maternal breastfeeding and lower respiratory tract infection, the infant of 0.28, uh, confidence interval 0.17 to 0.54. Uh, if we wanted an e-value for the estimate um, of 0.28, that's protective in direction. So we first take inverses, that's 3.57. We plug that into the e-value formula, 3.57 times 3. square root of 3.57 times 3.57 minus one gives us an e-value uh, for the confidence interval, of, uh, for the estimate of 6.6. .6. We do that for the limit of the confidence interval closest to the null, it's 0.54, take inverses, 1.85, plug that into the e-value formula, we get an e-value for the confidence interval of 3.1. And so we could make statements like with an observed risk ratio of 2.28, uh, an unmeasured confounder that was associated with both the outcome and the exposure by a risk ratio of 6.6 fold each above and beyond the measured covariates could explain away the estimate, but weaker confounding could not. To move the confidence interval to include the null and S, an unmeasured confounder that was associated with both the outcome and the exposure by a risk ratio of 3.1 fold each uh, could do so, but weaker confounding could not. So one could again potentially put statements like this into uh, papers to give the reader a sense as to how much confounding would be needed to explain uh, such estimates or confidence intervals away. And in this case, it looks like uh, pretty substantial confounding would be needed. Uh, and it can be helpful to go through different outcomes and try to assess uh, varying levels of robustness to unmeasured confounding. So here are other uh, results on the association between maternal breastfeeding and maternal ovarian cancer, childhood leukemia, uh, for maternal ovarian cancer, risk ratio of 0.5, confidence interval 0.3 to 0.8, childhood leukemia, risk ratio of 0.7, confidence interval point, sorry, risk ratio of 0.8, confidence interval 0.7 to 0.9. Um, and then we can go on and calculate the E values for the estimate and the limit of the confidence interval closest to the null. So with lower respiratory tract infection, it looks like it's fairly robust. We'd need, say, low socioeconomic status to be associated with a threefold increase in um, lower respiratory tract infection and be threefold more lack of breastfeeding should be threefold more likely amongst um, uh, those with low socioeconomic status versus high. Um, so that would be pretty substantial confounding. We don't often observe risk ratios of threefold in the literature. Um, with maternal ovarian cancer, E value for the confidence interval 1.8, I mean, still looking moderately robust to confounding. We, we do occasionally get risk ratios this, this high with various exposures. Um, but for it to be associated with both breastfeeding and with um, maternal ovarian cancer by one point fold, that might seem a little less plausible, but hard to be absolutely certain. But once we move on to childhood leukemia, E value for the confidence interval is 1.4. Now we really are moving into the territory of, of reverse ratios we are routinely seeing in the literature. So we might say, kind of all other things being equal, fairly strong evidence for robustness of an effect for uh, lower respiratory tract infection, maybe more moderate for ovarian cancer, uh, somewhat modest for childhood leukemia. Just because we have a low E value doesn't mean the effect's not there. Um, it doesn't mean the effect necessarily is explained away by unmeasured confounding. It's just that we, we don't know. The evidence is less certain. Um, so the proposal in this paper in the Annals of Internal Medicine published in 2017 was that in observational studies intended to assess causality, we supplement the p-value with, with either the e-value or some other form of sensitivity analysis. But some form of sensitivity analysis essentially should be done in all papers. Uh, that are intended to assess evidence for causality. The E-value is just a particularly simple way to, to proceed. Um, and importantly, the P-value and the E-value are giving different pieces of information. The P-value is essentially a measure of evidence for an association, 
Um, but the E value is really a, a measure pertaining to evidence that that association is causal and it's robust to confounding. And the two can potentially go in, in different directions. If we were to compare maternal ovarian cancer and childhood leukemia, the E value for maternal ovarian cancer is more extreme, 1.8 versus 1.4. But for the P value, um, the P value for childhood leukemia is more extreme, P value less than 0.001, whereas with maternal ovarian cancer is still fairly extreme, but just 0.006. So a more extreme P value for leukemia, a more extreme E value for maternal ovarian cancer. Essentially stronger evidence for an association between breastfeeding and leukemia, but stronger robustness of the association um, for uh, maternal ovarian cancer. What's going on here? Well, it's nothing real magical. It's just the fact that with childhood leukemia, um, our confidence interval is a bit closer to an L than it is with maternal ovarian cancer, so less confounding is needed to shift it. Um, but the confidence interval itself is narrower for childhood leukemia, and so we're getting a more extreme p-value for childhood leukemia than we are for maternal ovarian cancer. Um, the p-value can essentially always be made larger for any non-null association by just increasing the sample size. Uh, but that's not the case with the e-value. As the sample size gets larger and larger, the e-value for the confidence interval will essentially converge to that for the estimate. And in another context, Paul Rosenbaum refers to that limit as the sample size goes to infinity of the robustness as, as the design sensitivity. Um, but what's arguably most relevant for a given study is not what happens when the sample size goes to infinity, but what evidence do we have in the available data itself. Uh, so there are several important points of interpretation with these e-values. Uh, first, what constitutes a large e-value is really relative to the exposure and outcome um, under study. Um, and so, you know, if we got an e, if we had a good study with good confounding control with an e-value of two for all-cause mortality, we might think that's reasonable evidence for robustness to confound. We don't know all that many um, exposures that increase or decrease um, all-cause mortality by twofold. But if our outcome were suicide and the e-value were two, that might be not as much evidence because we do know risk factors associated with suicide by twofold or fivefold or even or even tenfold. And, and so there we would want to be more cautious. So again, it's always relative to the exposure and outcome under study. And it can be helpful in say an online supplementary table to present associations between all the measured covariates and the outcome exposure to get a sense as to how large um, these are in practice for the measured covariates. What constitutes a large e-value is also relative to the measured confounders. If we've done a really good job of controlling for measured confounding, then an e-value of two might be considered substantial evidence. Uh, but if we're missing the three most important measured confounders, uh, or, or the, if, if the three most important confounders are unmeasured, uncontrolled for, um, then, uh, then an e-value of two might not be much evidence at all. So we always have to think about what have we already controlled for. Um, this approach is applicable in principle to multiple unmeasured confounders, um, but then the risk ratios itself corresponding to the sensitivity parameters correspond to any change in that whole set of unmeasured confounders. So if you were missing income, age, and baseline health status, it would be like comparing um, those who were young, rich, and healthy to those who were um, older, frail, and poor. And there we might imagine you know, a, a risk ratio of twofold, threefold, fourfold being quite, quite plausible. Um, so while it's in principle applicable, um, I think if you have multiple important unmeasured confounders, um, you know, you're going to need to have a huge e-value to have any evidence at all. Really, it's probably the wrong data set to be working with if you have multiple unmeasured uh, confounders. Um, it should also be, be noted that the e-value is conservative. I mean, it's considering the most bias that unmeasured confounder with given sensitivity analysis parameters could achieve. It doesn't mean that the actual unmeasured confounder is able to generate that much bias. For example, a really rare unmeasured confounder um, generally won't generate the bias of the magnitude indicated by, by the bounding factor or the e-value formula. But that conservative nature can, in some circumstances, be helpful insofar as um, if we've controlled for a rich set of measured confounders and we still have um, a, a large E value, then we have a pretty compelling case uh, for the, uh, the sum of the association, in fact, being causal. So that can be fairly persuasive. Um, but we can't really use the E value in the same way to argue that there's, that there's no effect. Um, uh, you know, a small E value doesn't mean there's no effect. It just means we, we don't know that the evidence isn't entirely clear. 
But it, you know, it's important to note that absence of evidence is not the equivalent to evidence for the, for the absence of, of, of the effect. Um, but what we can do and what can be useful is if we have uh, association close to null, we can ask how much confounding would be necessary to shift it to some more substantively meaningful value. We can look at what one might call non-null E value. So if we have an observed estimate of uh, risk ratio RR and we want to know what's the minimum uh, confounding strength that would be required to shift it to some other value RR true, what we can do is we can take the ratio of the two, what we want to shift it to in the observed risk ratio, call that RR prime, and plug that into the E value formula. And that will give us minimum strength of these confounding associations to, to, to accomplish a shift that large. Um, if that ratio is less than one, once again, we had take inverses before applying the E value formula. Um, so this is the approach on the uh, risk ratio scale. The approach also works with other uh, scales. It works with an odds ratio with a rare outcome, hazard ratio with a rare outcome at the end of follow-up, ratio of count outcomes, ratio of continuous positive outcomes if we just replace the risk ratios with hazards ratios or, or odds ratios or so on. Um, with odds ratios with a common outcome, we do have to be a bit more careful. Um, the odds ratio itself then is often a, a vast overestimate of the corresponding um, risk ratio and the two aren't, aren't comparable. Um, one way to try to get an approximate E value, it turns out to be taking the square root of the odds ratio to get an approximate risk ratio. And I've showed in other work that provided the outcome probabilities are between 20% and 80%. The square root of the odds ratio will always get you to within 25% of the um, true risk ratio, whereas the Odds ratio itself, if interpreted as a risk ratio, can be off by, by 300%. Um, so, and, and, and that odds ratio transformation turns to be, uh, uh, to be the, the, the um, minimax optimal conversion of the uh, odds ratio to the risk ratio for any symmetric uh, probability interval around 0.5. But uh, in any case, that square root transformation can help get us an approximate risk ratio, and then we can apply the E value formula to that. Other conversions are available for hazards ratios with an outcome that's common at the, at the end of follow-up, and those are given in the Annals of Internal Medicine paper. Um, we can also kind of get an approximate E value for um, continuous outcomes, differences in continuous outcomes using conversions that are often used in the meta-analysis uh, literature. Um, we can get an approximate risk ratio if we have a standardized effect size of magnitude D, where we take the outcome and divide it by its standard deviation. If that had a standard error of SD, then as our approximate risk ratio, we can take E to the 0.91 times D. And for the approximate confidence interval, E to the 0.91 times D plus minus 1.78 times the standard error for that standardized effect size. Um, and this is essentially converting our standardized effect size to odds ratios using the conversions in the meta-analysis literature and then taking the square root to get the approximate risk ratio and then apply the E-value formula to that. N now, these are only partially desirable insofar as um, these are approximations, um, whereas the risk ratio results were exact. And again, there are other, I think, helpful, useful um, techniques on the, uh, on the um, outcome difference scale as, uh, as, as well. Um, and so some of the advantages of the E-value approach um, are, are lost with these other effect sizes. Um, I do think there are a number of advantages to this E-value um, approach. It's easy to compute. You can do it by hand, but we also have an online E-value calculator and R and SATA packages, and those tools are available on my website. It's easy to compute. It's easy to interpret and report. One can literally just kind of copy and paste the text. It's a standardized effect metric across different scales. It doesn't make the functional form assumptions. It removes some of the subjectivity and sensitivity analysis, and it moves away from parameterizing um, the sensitivity analysis parameters on the odds ratio scale, which I think can sometimes exaggerate uh, robustness. But I think especially because of ease of computation and implementation and ease of reporting and interpretation, it has become quite, quite popular. In the three and a half years since it was published, it was, it's been cited in over a thousand papers, over 500 in 2020 um, alone. And, and again, I think this is not an indication of its superiority to other techniques. I think it's only an indication of the ease of use and reporting and interpretation. But that was precisely what it was designed to, to do, to kind of leave researchers without any excuse to at least performing um, some sort of sensitivity analysis. I do think a more extensive sensitivity analysis when journals and collaborators and editors will allow it is always preferable. Um, but this is a you know, very simple, crude, straightforward way to implement at least something. Um, I do think there are certain circumstances where it should be avoided. 
And that's especially the case when there's a rare known unmeasured confounder that's rare. It's just this approach is just going to be too conservative then. And I think using other approaches and, and formulas like that of Schleselman or others uh, can be useful in those circumstances. Uh, if you like this approach, and you may not, uh, but if you do, uh, we've, we've generalized it to other settings, um, selection bias, differential measurement error, confounding and mediation analysis, confounding meta-analysis, publication bias, and most recently multiple bias uh, uh, analysis, kind of generalizations of this same sort of bounding conservative, um, but easy to use and report and implement approach. Uh, so in conclusion, I think these sensitivity analysis techniques um, as a whole really are important and, and, and powerful to uh, be able to assess the sensitivity or robustness of our conclusions to potential uh, confounding. I really do believe these techniques should be used more often than they are. Um, we can relax a lot of the assumptions that are traditionally been made, but again, I think a lot of the other techniques are very useful as, as well. Uh, if we wanna do something really crude, we can report just the minimum magnitude of the confounding associations needed to explain away the association using this E value metric. The E value suggests that the evidence is robust. Again, that can be a pretty strong argument that some of the association is in fact causal. Again, it's more difficult to use this approach to, to argue for an effect being absent. Often there, uh, we really need a, a large uh, randomized trial to definitively establish that an effect is absent. But I think too many of our interpretive practices have been inherited from randomized trials. Um, often in randomized trials, the p-value is taken a measure, is a measure of evidence for causation. And in a well-designed randomized trial with no loss to follow up, it is a reasonable measure. But in observational studies, it's not. Often the central threat there is not statistical uncertainty, but potential unmeasured confounding. And so I think the e-value helps uh, correct this, as do other sensitivity analysis. I do think these techniques should be used more, more broadly. Um, I think doing so would put our science on much firmer foundation. I think too often in epidemiology, we report an association and two weeks later, it's, it's reversed by some other um, uh, publication. And I think often it's, again, not taking this issue of confounding sufficiently seriously. So I think this should be done routinely, either the E-value or some other sensitivity analysis approach. But whether or not this is done, of course, depends in part on you all on taking up these uh, suite of sensitivity analysis techniques and implementing in them in practice. The E-value is just one particularly straightforward and crude way to do so. That concludes my presentation. Thank you all for listening and happy to take questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tyler. Uh, that is an excellent presentation, simple as your statistic is intended to be. Uh, and I already have some questions here in the chat. You had um, agreed to stay on a few minutes later. So if you don't mind, I think we'll request you to stay for another maybe 10 minutes. Uh, I'm happy to do so. 10, 10 minutes since we're starting the questions a bit towards the end of the talk. Um, I'll begin with a question from uh, Kaberi Dasgupta. Uh, she's our, uh, the director of the uh, Center for Outcomes Research, uh, where this presentation is being held. And um, Kaberi, I'm going to read out your question, so you can, uh, you, you might, do, unless you want to do so yourself. It's fine if you read it, Nandini. Thank you very much uh, for, for joining us, Tyler. I have a very, I'm an epidemiologist physician, by no means a biostatistician, so it's a very rudimentary question. But it kept striking me that the E value seems very tied to the magnitude of effect, which goes along with, you know, assumptions around causation or criteria for causation. So could you ever have a low E value if you have a smaller magnitude of effect? Or I, I was just wondering about, um, in a way, does it, is it the quantification of what we, what's signaled by a large magnitude of effect like lung cancer and smoking, the, that relationship? Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, it, it is directly related to the magnitude of the effect estimate. It's just a transformation of that essentially to the unmeasured confounding association scale. Um, so it, it sort of formalizes the, the, the Hill causal criteria notion of, of strength, um, right. but it does so quantitatively. Um, and it's a highly nonlinear relationship between the risk ratio itself, especially at low levels of the risk ratio, um, it, it is a highly nonlinear relationship. And those are often the sorts of risk ratios we're, we're observing. But there's, there's really nothing in the E value that's not in the estimate and confidence interval itself. I mean, that's the same, same as the case with the P value. 
Um, but we can't generally do that calculation in our head, so it's often helpful to look at both. Um, and, and I think likewise with the E value, we can have an estimate and confidence intervals, both of which are highly statistically significant, but one has a confidence interval going down to 1.05 and the other to 1.12, 1.12, and they have very, very different E values for the, for the confidence interval. Um, so it can be less transparent just looking at the effect size itself. Once we do the conversion, we have a much better sense as to the strength of those confounding associations needed. But it really is nothing more, you know, just like the p-value, it's nothing more than what you get from the estimate in the confidence interval in terms of the actual informational content. Thank you. Thank you very much for that explanation. Uh, I see two questions. I'm going to first ask Ben Smith, and then I'll after that, um, ask Walid al -Sunaydar. So Ben, please go ahead. Thanks, Nandini, and thank you, Tyler. Um, so I have a question. Um, I think you alluded to this, but uh, didn't get into the details. So if, if we go back to this, this smoking lung cancer example, um, I could think, I could imagine that uh, uh, risk ratio between the unmeasured confounder and the exposure and the outcome uh, could, could be quite rare in terms of its prevalence, but have a very strong uh, so ratio. Um, and so I'm curious, how does the prevalence of factor into this? Um, because you could have really strong risk ratios, but the, the unmeasured confounder be very, very rare, in which case it seems hard to imagine that it could shift the, you know, it could account for the relationship between smoking and lung cancer. Has, yeah. Is it independent of that or, or, or not? Yeah, no. So the E value and that bounding factor formula are really considering worst case scenarios. It's searching over all possible distributions of the unmeasured confounder and trying to make them as bad as possible. Okay. So it's conservative in that sense. So if you know something about the unmeasured confounder, for example, if you know that it's rare, um, then you can do better than what these formulas are, are suggesting. And that, that's definitely one situation. I, you know, I don't think this approach is so helpful. Um, let's see if I have uh, further, some further slides. So yeah, um, if you actually know the prevalence of the unmeasured confounder amongst the exposed and the unexposed, then you can use formulas, for example, by Schleselman and all, though there are others to get at what the exact bias factor is. Uh, these formulas typically make that no interaction assumption. But if you're willing to specify a lot more parameters, you can you can relax that assumption um, as well. But it, you'll you'll see that you know if the prevalence of the unmeasured confounder is only five percent, that it generates a lot less bias. And so I, th I think you know in, in that situation, some of these other approaches um, are are useful. And again, I think often the ones even the techniques that make assumptions still are are useful for getting some handle on how big of a problem is unmeasured confounding in a particular scenario or or not. Thanks, that answers the question. Great. Thank you very much uh, for that response. Uh, there's a question from Walid, and Walid, could you please? Uh... Yes, um, thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Vanderweel, for the um, uh, wonderful presentation. Um, I'm just you know, wondering, aren't you concerned that uh, with a statement like um, E value, E stands for evidence that the association is causal, that there is a high potential for misuse of the A value because many sources of bias can actually explain the observed um, association, not just unmeasured compounding. Uh, but it seems that when we are reporting the E value, we're, we're probably you know, just you know, putting all those possibilities away and just saying that um, this is what, you know, an unmeasured compounding need to have an association with the exposure and the outcome to explain that this um, estimate is causal. And, and I'm afraid this might create another problem that we struggle with for the next 30 years, like we've been dealing with the p-value so far. So I need your thoughts on that. Yeah. No, so, I mean, we've tried to be careful in the language we've used. We said it's a measure pertaining to the evidence for causality, not a measure of the evidence for causality, which would need to take into account multiple sources of bias. I mean, what it really is is a measure of robustness to confounding, um, to unmeasured confounding, 
um, which of course is relevant to assessing whether a relationship is causal. Um, but we've extended this, this approach um, to address a number of other biases, including selection bias and differential measurement error. Um, and most recently in a paper, which will be coming out later this year to looking at multiple sources of bias simultaneously. So you could do um, these bounding factor calculations for unmeasured confounding and selection bias simultaneously, unmeasured confounding and differential measurement error, or, 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 or all three. Um, so you know what, what you use really depends on the context and what you think that the central threats um, are. Mm -hmm. When selection bias is present, it tends to generate biases of larger magnitude than, than confounding does. And you can kind of see this if you walk through some of these other papers and, and calculations. Um, I mean, it's arguably somewhat less common, maybe not uncommon, but somewhat less common. I mean, you can have studies with pretty good um, follow-up on representative samples. Um, um, but when it is present, um, it, selection bias often is a, a greater source of, of bias and same with, with differential measurement error. I mean, the, the E value for unmeasured confounding you'll, you'll see is always larger than the observed risk ratio. And depending on the scenario, that's not necessarily the case with selection bias. The, the equivalent to the E value for selection bias is, can be smaller. You kind of need <laughs> smaller associations with regard to selection bias than the observed risk ratio to explain an observed effect estimate um, away. So I, you know, I completely agree. Uh, you know, if we're trying to assess causation, we need to think about all possible forms of, of bias. Mm -hmm. I mean, and likewise, model misspecification um, as, as well. So we've tried to generalize this approach to a number of other uh, contexts. Um, but yeah, the original E-value idea was really just to assess robustness to a measured confounding. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, that, that's reassuring because I agree with Walid that uh, we might then have another uh, statistic that we're trying to explain. Uh, but it's reassuring to see that indeed you have studied the impact of this. Uh, or, I mean, how you've studied how this statistic could also be used to uh, gauge other types of uh, biases. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? I don't. Uh... It looks like someone's raising their hand. So yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. Yes, Raman, here. Yeah. Thank okay, you, Raman, please. Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Tai. It's a great presentation. Uh, I'm just wondering if you look at the estimates that should be fine, but when it comes to the confidence intervals, it seems like uh, we are still playing a little bit uh, with the formula that you have shown. Have you ever tried other methods like, let's say, mid P or exact odds ratio? Particularly, it's not odds ratio, it's a little bit uh, more skeptical than the risk ratios. Um, is there a kind of uh, other, other um, confidence intervals you tried? Uh, uh, along with the one that you just presented here. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think maybe two issues were, were, were raised with the question. One is kind of risk ratio scale versus other scales. Right. Um, uh, one can do something similar with, uh, with, with the odds ratio scale. And we have those, some of those results in the online supplement to the 2016 epidemiology paper that goes through all the technical. Uh, details. The 2017 Alice of Internal Medicine was intended to be a very intuitive tutorial, but the 2016 paper in epidemiology kind of gives all the mathematics. Um, and in the online supplement there, we give the formulas for the odds ratio scale. I think one needs to be careful there because um, often those parameters are then interpreted as, um, as risk ratios, and that, that, that's generally wrong. Um, often, even if our outcomes are rare, our exposure is common. And so, you know, I think often the parameterizations of sensitivity analysis parameters on odds ratio scales are misinterpreted and in fact exaggerate uh, robustness. Um, we've also done this on the risk difference scale and one can get exact results, but it is quite interesting where on the, um, on the risk ratio scale, and the same is true with the odds ratio scale, as the number of categories of U increases, um, the bounds stay the same uh, with the sensitivity parameters defined as they were. Um, but that's not the case on the risk ratio scale. As the number of categories increases, the bounds get, get, get worse and, and worse and, and deteriorate. So it's an interesting property of the ratio scale um, 
that uh, that 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 the you know the the bias formulas the bounding factors are in fact independent of the number of categories in U, and I think that's a fairly attractive property. Um, one can also parameterize the um, sensitivity parameters on a risk ratio scale, but apply it to a risk difference. Um, and then one still retains that nice property of um, the, uh, the, the bound not depending on the number of categories of, of you. So I'm not sure that addressed all of your questions. There might've been one about confidence intervals as well, which I could talk about also, but that's on kind of the uh, scale that we're parameterizing these Thank parameters. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Tyler. Uh, there were 80 people uh, at some point during the uh, presentation. Uh, we've gone a bit over time, and so some of our colleagues have left. Uh, I'd like to uh, therefore thank you very much. And um, just I want to make sure that everyone's here uh, to thank you. Don't clap, unfortunately, but uh, <laughs> excellent uh, presentation. I see one new message. 